We are traveling through our third series of substance. I call it a series of substance just because it's built on the solid foundation of the book of Genesis. Which, let me just be really clear, the book of Genesis, are you listening? The book of Genesis, which is literal history. Literal history. It's not metaphor. It's not mythological. It's not symbolic. It's not poetry. It is straightforward, straightforward historical fact. I think everybody needs to hear that. That's the way Genesis is written. That is exactly what we believe. And so the first series was called The Reality of Everything. The second series was called the fa- about Father Abraham and the life of faith. This third series is called The Age of the Patriarchs, the story of God's chosen people learning to live in covenant with him. So Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, got exactly what they wanted, the blessing. But they also got something that they did not want, and that was they got a clear, incredible threat from Brother Esau, who stated quite clearly to anyone who was willing to listen that as soon as my father is dead, I'm going to kill that mangy brother of mine for cheating me out of my birthright and stealing my blessing. So Rebecca and eventually Isaac as well, determined that the best course of action was to send Jacob away, to leave the Ponderosa in Beersheba and travel 850 kilometers north to a region called Padam Aram and go to his uncle Laban's place out there, Laban being his mother's brother. That is where we pick up then the next installment of the age of the patriarchs. So the man who has the full blessing of his father is now officially a fugitive, escaping the murderous threats of his brother Esau. He has an epic journey in front of him to go from Beersheba in the south, the lowest circle, 
up through Palestine, along the edge of the Great Desert, across the north end of the Great Desert, to the region of Padam Aram, which is the top circle, and specifically to the town of Haran, where his uncle Laban lived. Jacob was not in fine form at this particular point of his life. He probably felt guilty over what he had done. I can't help but think he must have felt guilty over what he did. He certainly felt confused, for after receiving the full blessing from his father, he's now running for his life. Ahead of him is nothing but unknowns and questions. Like, what am I getting myself into? What will I find when I get to my uncle's place? Will I ever see my parents again? And quite naturally, he would be wondering, did my brother Esau follow me? He's an expert hunter, right? Is he now hunting me? And so there he was on the second or third night of his long journey, completely alone, somewhere out there in the hills, underneath the stars, probably jumping at every hoot of every owl and every gust of wind, every salamander scampering by, he jumps, and he thought he was all alone. But he wasn't alone, for God was with him. And on that holy night, God revealed himself to this patriarch of the Jewish people, to this deceptive, ambitious, manipulative, 77-year-old mama's boy named Jacob. And God revealed himself to Jacob in spite of Jacob's shortcomings, promising to be with him, promising to bless him, promising to protect him, promising to provide for him wherever he went. This is the kind of story that speaks to people like you and I. For who has not felt all alone? Who has not felt conflicted? Who has not come to the end of their resources? Who has not felt discouraged? Who has not been afraid about their future? Who has not had the feeling deep down in their soul that surely God will never look at them again? Well, Jacob had not gone very far those first few days, maybe 75 kilometers from the Ponderosa, when he came to an area called Bethel. That's right. 
As Jacob lay down to sleep that night, he did take a stone. And I assume he wrapped his cloak around it. I always have to assume that. And then he uses that stone as a pillow. As we just heard, Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, had been to Bethel twice. Once he went there on, stopped there on the way to Egypt. And then once again on his way back from Egypt, he stopped at Bethel and he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord, the scripture says very clearly. And I'm sure that his grandson Jacob knew that information. And isn't it tempting to think that Joseph found, or Joseph, that Jacob found that altar and he took one of those stones to be his pillow. As he slept that night, tossing and turning and wrestling with his thoughts, God appeared to him and gave him this most famous of dreams. This dream of a giant ladder all the way coming down from heaven to earth with the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. What was this ladder? In Hebrew, in Hebrew, rather, the angels were ascending and descending, it says, on a sulam. It's a very difficult word, not because it's so long, but because it only occurs in the Bible once. This is it. This is all we have to go on. And when you have one appearance of a word, translators have a tough time. The King James Version uses the word ladder, but maybe staircase is a better, more appropriate word to accommodate all those angels that Jacob saw making the trip down to earth and then journeying back up to heaven. But whatever that was that Jacob saw in his dream, it, was, it served as a bridge, a passageway, a conduit of some sort connecting heaven with earth. And it showed Jacob just how close how real and how accessible God is. How close, how real angels are and spiritual things are. About a dozen people in the Bible have seen angels. Abraham did, Daniel did, Mary and Joseph did, Paul the Apostle did, and so did the servant of Elisha the prophet who, as you might recall, saw the mountains around a particular city teeming with angelic warriors ready to do the will of the Lord. Elisha's servant got the idea. He got the message. Jacob got the idea, got the message. And I want us to get the idea and get the message that God is here. God is near. God is ever present. God is ever ready and on the job through his power and through the delegated power of his angelic armies. Standing at the top of the staircase in Jacob's dream was the Lord God himself giving Jacob the most incredible blessing for a man in his predicament at that time. The dream was awesome. But the word of blessing that God spoke was even more awesome. It certainly meant more to Jacob than the dream itself. For God said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you'll spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Does that sound familiar? I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God had revealed himself to Abraham many times. God revealed himself to Isaac a few times. And this was the first of eight times that God would appear to Jacob in one way or another. Here he gave Jacob the same blessing that he had given to Abraham and to Isaac. 
And lest we forget, this is Jacob who had just cheated Esau to get the birthright, who had just schemed to get the blessing, who had just lied straight up to his father's face, and yet God gives Jacob the blessing in this full and fantastic way. You would naturally think that after all the deceit and all the cunning and all the sin and bad behavior, surely God would knock off a few points from the blessing and give Jacob a little miniature blessing or a little discounted blessing. But God doesn't do anything of the sort. He gives Jacob the full blessing in all of its grandeur, in all of its glory. And he gives it at a time in Jacob's life when he needed it the most. Three things. God speaks to Jacob's aloneness. I am the Lord. I am with you. I will not leave you. I will do all that I have promised. Now it's true that the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac, they did not have large families. But they did have massive households consisting of servants and herdsmen and associates and friends and allies. You might remember that when Abraham had to go to war, he was able to enlist 318 fighting men from his own household, besides the women and the children and those who could not go to war. That makes us conclude that Abraham's household might have been over a thousand people, a village. And he continued to prosper and prosper and prosper, and much of his wealth was passed along to his son Isaac. This is what Jacob was used to, to be surrounded by people. But he, here he is now up there in the mountains, totally alone, and he doesn't even have one single servant with him. Do you ever feel alone? Do you know that 20% of our congregation lives alone? Or maybe you feel spiritually alone because your spouse is not a believer. Or maybe you've been widowed recently and you're alone. Or maybe you're living in an apartment or in a crowded section of the city and you're surrounded by people, 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 and yet it's like there's no one there. Because there's no one that you can share with. There's no one you can unburden yourself with. There's no one you can trust. There's no one who seems interested in you. There's no one who pays you any attention. Well, that's the kind of world we live in. But listen to what God says to Jacob. I am the Lord. I am with you. And I will not leave you. And I will do all that I have promised. That was an important word for Jacob at that particular time, and it's an important word for us. For God is showing by this saloon, this ladder, this staircase, that he is a God who comes down. That's what this is saying. He is a God who comes down. He's a God who dispatches angels that is, ministers and messengers, he dispatches them to earth to do his bidding. He is a God who sent his own son down to the earth. He's a God who sent his own Holy Spirit down to his people to be with them in their time of need, in their darkness, in their confusion in their fear, in their uncertainty. Just like Jacob. That's what this story is telling us. The staircase originated and came down from heaven to the earth because man's ladders from earth to heaven don't reach very high. That is important, that this ladder came down from heaven not from earth up to heaven. 
The rickety man-made ladders constructed by Charles Taze Russell for the Jehovah's Witnesses or by Joseph Smith who built one for the Latter-day Saints or by Mr. Muhammad who built one for the Muslims or by the Buddha who built one for the Buddhists or those ladders built by the New Agers or by the good doers. I don't mean you doers, you're good. But those ladders built by men don't reach all the way up to heaven. In fact, the trees in your backyard reach closer to heaven than those ladders built by men. But God built a ladder that came all the way down, down to where Jacob was lying on that hill and down to where you are. That's the kind of merciful God he is. People might abandon you. Your father and mother might forsake you. Maybe no one on this planet actually understands you. But God says, I understand you. I've, I've seen it all. My son went through it all. I get it. You're not alone. And so God speaks to Jacob's aloneness. The second thing he does is he speaks to Jacob's lack of resources. He says to him, I will give you and your descendants the land in which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and they'll spread out to the west and the east the north and to the south. Now how could this be true? Jacob had left all of his people behind. He had left all of his possessions behind. He had a donkey, and whatever that donkey could carry... And that was it. He came from great wealth, but he had no wealth. And that becomes very clear because when he gets to his uncle's place, he falls in love with Rachel and he promises to work for her for seven years because he has no dowry to give. All he has to give is the sweat of his brow and the labor of his hands. And so now God speaks in the midst of Jacob's poverty. He says, I'm going to give you the land on which you're lying. And I'll give you the land to the west and the land over to the east, the land to the north and the land to the south as well. Have you ever felt like Jacob, where you're at the end of your resources, you're just barely scraping by, where everything that you own could fit on the back of a donkey or in the trunk of a Volkswagen. But you know, there is a very real and a very profound way in which God says to you, his child, just you wait. I'm going to give you more than you could ever ask for or imagine. You're going to be richer than Jacob, richer than Isaac, and richer than Abraham himself. Pastor, are we talking about a prosperity gospel here? Absolutely not. Because the real prize are the riches that are in Christ Jesus, the promised one. You know the saying, whoever takes the Son gets it all. We are co-heirs with Christ. Whatever belongs to Him belongs to us who believe in Him and who are found in Christ. We have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade we have been chosen from before the foundation of the world, adopted as his children, accepted in Christ, redeemed through his blood, forgiven of our sins. We know the mystery of his will. We're sealed with his Holy Spirit. In fact, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. That's an important verse. Whatever our poverty or our lack of resources might be, 
He will provide for our needs just as he promised. But it's absolutely nothing compared to what is yet to come. So God spoke to Jacob about his lack of resources. And the third thing he spoke to him about was his disgrace. When he said, all the peoples on the earth are going to be blessed through you and through your offspring, Jacob. Jacob thought to himself, really? Through a guy like me? Jacob had cheated his brother. He'd taken advantage of his brother's weakness and his spontaneity. Jacob had tricked his father. Jacob had lied to his father's face. And everyone in Isaac's household heard about it. In that massive household. Everyone who knew Jacob, everyone who served Jacob, they all knew what he had done. Surely because Esau had told them. As Jacob lay there that night, he knew his name was Mud back home. He had thoroughly disgraced himself and he knew it. His most valuable asset, which is his name and reputation, was shot to bits. And yet God comes to him and he says, I haven't given up with you. I'm going to bless all the people on the earth through you and through your offspring too. I haven't changed my plan. You're still going to be the one through whom in my good time the Savior of the world, the Messiah, will come. Does that third point speak to you? Have you lost face? Have you been disgraced lately? Have you disgraced yourself? Have you done something so bad you can never overcome it? Well, what if you would hear God say to you, I haven't given up on you. That was in the past. I'll take you right now, right where you are, as is. And you'll still become a channel of blessing to all kinds of people. What would you say to that? What would you say? Oh, what I would say is, how is that even possible? That God could still use someone like me? I will answer by pointing out that Jesus spoke about Jacob's dream. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus spoke about Jacob's ladder? He did. In John chapter 1, before I show you the verses, let me set the stage. Jesus was busy calling his disciples. You, you, come on. You, yeah, I'll take you. Come on. And Philip was so impressed by Jesus, he rushed out and he found his friend Nathaniel and he said, dude, you got to come with me. You got to meet this guy. And Nathaniel, as you may recall, was sitting under a a fig tree. Sitting under a fig tree. That's exactly what the passage says. But you know what I learned this week? Sitting under the fig tree is code language. Code language. It's language used among rabbis and teachers of the law. Sitting under a fig tree means he was prayerfully meditating on the scriptures. Isn't that cool? Sitting under a fig tree, he was prayerfully meditating on the scriptures. Look it up. Google it. It's true. May we all sit under a fig tree every day at some point in that day. So as Nathaniel's sitting there under the fig tree, prayerfully meditating the scriptures, what do you suppose he was meditating upon. I think it was Genesis chapter 8 and 20. 28. He was meditating on the dream of Jacob's ladder. And Jesus implies it. He doesn't come right out and say it, but he implies it. Here's the passage. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Nathanael asked, how do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you while you're still under the fig tree 
before Philip even called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And at that point, I think Nathaniel fainted and hit his head on the ground because that was exactly what he was thinking about while he was under the fig tree. Take note of the words Jesus uses. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Compare that with Genesis 28. Jacob had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. It's subtle, but it's powerful. Jesus is saying, I am the ladder. I am the staircase. I am the bridge. I am the conduit. I am the one who comes down from heaven to earth and only by me can a sinful man or woman ever ascend and make it up to heaven. And as we put our faith in this Christ, he addresses our aloneness and he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And as we put our faith in this Christ, he addresses our poverty and lack of resources, and he says, I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory with the best yet to come. And as we put our faith in him, he addresses our disgrace. And he says, I can still use you as my channel of blessing. I'm not finished with you yet. Do you know him? Do you know this stairway to heaven named Jesus? Have you put your faith entirely, completely in him? Have you ever sat under a fig tree and invited him in? You can forget about building a stairway to heaven. You can't do it. Nobody can. But he comes down to meet you right where you are to be your salvation, to be your wisdom, to be your hope, to be your friend, to be your glory, to be your all in all. Isn't it time? that you looked up from the rock that you're resting your head on or smashing it against. He's coming down now to meet you where you are. He's coming down with his angels sent by God to be the very ministers of those who are being saved even today. Can you see that? Can you see him? Lord, open the eyes of the blind this morning for Jesus' sake, who is the way, the truth, the life, and the stairway to heaven. Amen. Lord, we come before you and pray that you'll bless this story. I pray that you would speak to our aloneness, that you would speak to our poverty, that you would speak to our disgrace. Lord, that you would show yourself. I pray for every heart here that is wondering, is this message for me? For every person here who's been hitting their head against a stone, Lord, open their eyes to see the stairway to heaven, which is your very self, sent by the Father to the earth to die on a cross of wood, to be raised from the dead. 
Lord, let every hopeless one, every disgraced one, every alone one, every impoverished one, let each one look up and put their hope, their faith, and their trust in you right now. I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.